Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to the beginning of our academic year grand round series. So thanks for everybody coming. Um, I'm actually going to introduce someone who's going to introduce our speaker because I think some of the, uh, I, I know some of the early stage faculty and all of the residents don't, don't know this person, but many other senior people uh, know him, and that's Don Connolly. Don is sitting here. He, uh, I think we trained together, and he was a terrific um, clinical pathologist and, became, and did graduate work in health informatics here and really became a true leader nationally in this and has participated at the highest levels in health informatics in the country on consortia, on committees, and everything else. And um, he was a stalwart in this department for many years. And uh, I can absolutely say he's smarter than me because he's retired. <laughs> <laughs> and he's enjoying life. As I, as I learned last night, I knew he had grandkids, but I didn't know he had 13. <laughs> so that's a, a record for people I know. But he's had a tremendous career along with the other colleagues. And, our health informatics. They had a training program for 31 or 32 years. It was pr probably the best program in the country. And so we were really fortunate to have him be so prominent in the field and in this department. So Don, you're going to make the introduction, but I wanted to thank you. Thank you, Leo. Actually, I think we did start the training the same day. <laughs> Well, it's my honor and, and, and great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker this morning, Dr. Bruce Friedman from the University of Michigan. Uh, I've known Bruce uh, since, I think, 1982, and uh, we've kind of gone through a lot of things uh, in, in informatics t together. Uh, Bruce started out his pathology training at Yale New Haven Hospital and the University of Michigan, becoming board certified in both AP and CP. After two years in the Army then, he went back and joined the faculty at the University of Michigan where, uh, where, where he's uh, been uh, for, for many, many years until his, until his own retirement. Uh, he first served as the associate director of the blood bank there and immediately started doing uh, research in, uh, in blood utilization and surgical cases and, and uh, studying blood utilization across the country. He was appointed director of the uh, pathology data systems of Michigan in 1982. So he started out as a blood banker, but then was invited to become the director of pathology data systems. And this really meant a dramatic career shift. At least I think, Bruce, it was a dramatic shift for you because you immediately uh, became a very avid and enthusiastic learner in this, in this field first. But then almost uh, very shortly thereafter also became an immediate educator in this field to, to bring that knowledge and the importance of informatics and information delivery for, for patient care uh, to the field of pathology. Uh, these two characteristics, his enthusiasm for learning, his own learning, but then also sharing this learning with, with others has really been the hallmark of, of, his, of his, uh, his career. He founded an annual clinical laboratory informatics uh, conference at, at Michigan, which was offered for 21 years. That's a long time for any, uh, uh, you know, any conference series. Uh, he, he soon, uh, uh, this meeting soon was, um, soon became kind of a must-attend meeting for both other informatics, uh, clinical informatics specialists, but also all, all pathologists and practitioners who were at that time seeing the importance of, of information systems in their laboratory for helping their clinicians take care of patients. He was then also founding member and one of two founding presidents of the Association for Pathology Informatics, which is kind of the organizational home of all people that are interested in, in uh, laboratory and pathology inf informatics. What I've always noted about Bruce in my years attending conferences with him, uh, many of these conferences he largely formulated, was both his, his own presentation of what he brought in, in terms of knowledge at the forefront of pathology and informatics, but also his in, insightful questioning of, of uh, uh, participants in the meeting. He was always uh, 
digging for his own learning and, and sharing this knowledge with others. And incidentally, he's going to uh, invite questions at, at any time during his con during his presentation this morning. So I ask you to be sure that uh, you're, you're you're invited to uh, bring in questions at any time because that's what that's what he was always doing in terms of learning and sharing. For his long-time commitment in the field and his many contributions, he has been honored by his many colleagues across uh, both nationally and, and internationally with multiple Lifetime Achievements Awards. Although uh, Bruce retired in 2006 from the faculty of, of the University of, of Michigan Pathology Department, uh, he uh, is still, uh, he very much, uh, stresses that he's an active emeritus a professor of pathology at Mich Michigan, and uh, it really is active. It is, it continues as, as this active exploration of, of learning and about things at the at the front edge of pathology, and uh, uh, in sharing this information, as he's always shared this information, but now in, in uh, his blogs, uh, Lab Soft News, I'd recommend that to to all of you, whatever stage you're at, as, as something to follow, because he's usually looking at the leading edge of, of laboratory uh, pathology informatics, so it's a great, uh, a great source of new ideas. This morning, Dr. Friedman comes to do, uh, to do what he has done so well throughout his career, sharing with us his learning about a potential new direction of pathology, in particular, its integrated diagnostics and integrated diagnostic servers. Dr. Friedman, welcome back to the University of Minnesota. Thank you. It's just, just great here. I, uh, Minnesota and Don were command central for informatics when I started in 1982. And the first thing I did was uh, put his number on my speed dial. Uh, the only number I've added since then has been my urologist. <laughs> Uh, Don uh, was my mentor and Ray Aller, and they were the two most prominent informaticians in the country. Uh, I will say there was probably only about five. <laughs> so being at the top of the list was not that difficult, but Don had tremendous technical depth and, uh, uh, and a tremendous amount of modesty, which tends to be a little bit unusual among some academic pathologists. But he, but he never blew his own horn, but is always outstanding. So uh, let me just quickly go through some definitions. You may be a little bit confused. What is integrated diagnostics? Integrated diagnostics is the close collaboration and possibly even merger, and I say that with some trepidation, between pathology and radiology. My chairman, Jay Hess, previous chairman, when I talked about a merger of pathology and radiology, he referred to that as a bridge too far. <laughs> let, me, let me then talk about close collaboration, or let me talk about a virtual department. I believe that we do an extremely poor job of reporting our brilliant data. What we do is we have this brilliant science in radiology, brilliant, brilliant science in pathology, and we dump it into the EHR, and we say to the clinicians, find the stuff you like. <laughs> now that makes absolutely no sense to me at all, but yet, Everyone sort of accepts that as the norm that we do that. And it wasn't that bad when we controlled our own LISs. But now with the EHR, it becomes even worse because we don't control that resource. So I will dump on EHRs a little bit later, but I'll save that for dessert. <laughs> uh, I think we have a significant problem. And I think we have these assets that we do not take adequate control of. I'll say on a later slide, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead, this is the golden age of diagnostics. The golden age of diagnostics. For heart difficult cases, cancer patients, the hard pull is the diagnosis. Therapy is generally after the fact and fairly trivial in cancer. Once you have the diagnosis, there's a lookup table, and the treatment becomes almost pro forma. We don't put enough value on what it is that we do. And I know pathologists and radiologists tend to be self-effacing. I don't believe that their worth is understood within the C-suite. And I think when we controlled our own IT assets, we had much more political power. But I think that is waning very quickly as the momentum and the center of influence is moving 
from the pathology and pathology and from informatics that Don pioneered into the C-suite with control of IT resources. I think we are facing an existential threat in pathology informatics as the C-suite adopts what I call an enterprise-wide solution. Basically, that's Epic wall-to-wall. -wall. And Epic has all of these modular programs, including Beaker for the lab, moving that out of the control of pathology to the central IT group. And I think we're losing functionality as a result, we're moving from best of breed systems to a good enough system, such as Beaker with Epic. We'll talk more about that later. But I do believe we're facing an existential threat. Um, I'll be making some references to my blog uh, throughout this uh, lecture. So when I retired in 2006, I wanted to, keep, to do something to keep myself in the game. And what I decided to do was start doing a blog called LabSoft News. The reason I raise this now is that this entire topic, integrated diagnostics, all of these ideas were initially raised on my blog. And throughout the lecture, I will show you the references. So nine years ago, I first raised the idea of integrated diagnostics and an integrated diagnostic server in my blog. Now, the appeal, I, I consider a blog as a vehicle for communicating midway between hallway conversations and the formal literature. And I feel inspired by the blog because it's a way of promoting and disseminating new ideas, but without having to work through a set of very annoying people, such as your, <laughs> such as your chairman. <laughs> <laughs> and referees for, for articles. So there are no impediments to promoting ideas. Now I realize the result is they're not always taken as seriously, hence it's taken, I think, nine years for this idea of integrated diagnostics to get some traction. Or maybe we weren't ready for the idea. But at any rate, I encourage you, particularly people with clinical appointments, I think it's a way of communicating with your peers and promoting new ideas. So that's why I raised this. So I encourage blogging by academic pathologists. I think it's not given sufficient credit in academic circles as making a contribution to the, quote, literature or to the knowledge. It's also a place where I believe sophisticated consumers can get a viewpoint of what's going on in pathology in the diagnostic world. So I'm going to give you a statement, and I want to see if you agree with this. One of the most important tasks of pathologists and radiologists is to imprint on the brains of the test ordering clinicians the most significant and actionable diagnostic information. So when I said before, we're dumping all these reports into the EHR, we don't know what happens to them. So I believe that we need to communicate more succinctly and more directly with the clinicians and give them actionable information. So going back to my definitions, integrated diagnostics is closer collaboration between pathologists and radiologists. And an integrated diagnostic server is a, it has not really been built yet today, but an integrated diagnostic server is a server under the control of pathology and radiology in which are contained all CP results, all AP results, all pathology images, and all radiology images. And then within that server are a set of heuristics and algorithms that will plot, design the fastest path to a diagnosis for that patient. So basically what I'm saying is the diagnosis, what I call the PR diagnosticians, by that I mean the pathologists and the radiologists, as opposed to the clini clinicians who are also diagnosticians, plot a path, the fastest path to a diagnosis, taking into account images and all the data that we generate. And I think that this is an unbelievably attractive idea if we can build something like this. Now, some people will say to me, in fact, a very close friend of mine says to me, he's a neuro-ophthalmologist, and he said, you can't do that. That's what we as clinicians do. And my response to that is that the clinicians are overwhelmed. They're seeing patients every 10 or 15 minutes. I think if we pre-digest some of this information, 
or are we going to be ahead of the game? Now, in printing on the brain, this is non-trivial. I think most clinicians, when they read reports, they may give a report five seconds or ten seconds of attention. They're looking for the key three or four sentences. I want to pre-digest everything that comes out of radiology and pathology, let's say, on a 24-hour basis, and then synthesize that and extract out the most relevant and actionable information and present that to the clinicians. I do not believe that the vast majority of clinicians will be offended by this. I believe they'll be laughing and jumping up and down if we can make them operate more efficiently. Now this is no small task because we're all in our silos. Radiologists, pathologists, and in fact we have multiple silos in pathology. We have CP and AP and they've evolved on slightly different trajectories. We have frequently different databases. So in fact, we have to integrate CP and AP before we have serious discussions with the radiologists about integrating our results with their results. The radiologists also have their own nomenclature, their own way. They talk about impressions rather than diagnoses. So there's a formidable gulf between us and the radiologists. So how would we go about pursuing this goal of integrated diagnostics? My idea is we just sit down with the radiologists and say, are we, are we doing the, the right job? Are we providing actionable and significant information to the clinicians? How do we get there? Is, are there ways that we can collaborate more tightly in order to achieve this goal? Now, having presented this summary, how do you react? Is there anyone that would want to react to this large, sort of high-level goal? Do you think that this is appropriate, doable, practical? Let me just get some opinions from you. <clears throat> Anyone want to comment on that? Yes, it's true. So, who, go ahead. What? I did. Okay, go ahead. It's definitely doable. The uh, technology that's available now uh, in informatics is unbelievable. And if we say we want this, we can do it. And that's encouraging. So, so we, we, we say that this is a practical goal and we need to pursue it. What, John, in your long experience, what would be the, the baby steps? How would you, what would be the way to do this organizationally and politically in a way that's non-threatening? <clears throat> well, we've got to be comfortable in, getting, in breaking down silos. That is going to be difficult. What are the major barriers <clears throat> to breaking down silos? Comfort, obviously, is People one. People are much more comfortable <coughs> if they're in a silo than if they're um, forced to expand out. Because once you go into <coughs> the silo, once you get this level of knowledge, you feel comfortable with it. But sometimes you really feel very uncomfortable trying to get more information from outside. Leo, did you want to say something? <coughs> You're not talking about this. I think mean, it should happen and will happen, and there's examples around the country. We chatted about what uh, Jonathan Braun has done at UCLA. So what, what he's done, and I heard about this maybe three or four years ago, um, and as Bruce educated me, they did this for competitive reasons, because LA, there's a few doctors there and uh, whatever. So this was on breast cancer, so they raised money and built a building. And basically, a woman walks in the door at 8 o'clock, and by 4 o'clock or earlier, she walks out the door with a diagnosis and a therapy plan. We have that in Toronto. And, and Obama says they have that in Toronto, too. So the radiologists are there, the oncologists are there, the surgeons are there, the pathologists, whatever, and they'll do everything right in that building, and it's a very comfortable setting, and uh, it's a really wonderful model. So. If you look at some of the big cancer hospitals, that, let's take um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. They obviously have departments of pathology, this, that, or whatever. But the real homes for the physicians there are these teams they've assembled. So there's a, you know, a prostate team, there's a breast team. So all of the docs related to that uh, organ system or organ, that's the, the, their predominant world that they live and work in. So it's a, 
it's, it, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have better patient care, more efficient patient care, better quality, a whole host of things that comes out of this. And, uh, and it's iterative with the radiologist, pathologist, and at all working in the same place physically. I oh. have decided that been working on this for a number of years as well. I definitely uh, think it is doable, but I'm intrigued by it. I'm very anxious to see how we are going to do it. So we are pathologists here. It's easy for us to, to say that truth is in the tissue. I'm going to tell you what it is and who is going to be responsible for aligning the radiologic findings with the pathology and what do we do when we don't when they are not aligned and well, that's, then that's the tough discussion yes. well, in Toronto is that is there anything analogous to that in Toronto type of alignment uh, uh, absolutely not and that's okay. okay so that's the problem yeah. so to me the alignment has to happen with people sitting in a room and what do you mean by that creating a common vocabulary and ultimately a structured report, which is what the clinicians want. So, so you know, we're sort of artists, we're scientists, we want this sort of latitude, but then it results in great heterogeneity in the way we report cases. So the first step is sitting down and creating this common vocabulary that is evolved on different trajectories. I think there also, though, has to be a standardized way for the input, you know, so the ordering protocols and all of that to Absolutely. Be standardized because otherwise the output we're going to get. Um, so we need to standardize and get away from the more subjective way <coughs> in which we report. So Mahmoud, in Canada, it, was the health system more conducive to creating these teams? Yes. yes absolutely. So we have that barrier. However, the good news <coughs> is we're moving, I don't know how long it's going to take, from fee-for-service to a value-based care system. Now, under fee-for-service, everyone was, rewarding, was, was rewarded for super-specialization and productivity. And we're going now to a system, at least, well, I'm told, value-based, where, where what you do is, and the significance of what you do is more important than productivity. But this is going to take at least five years to, to make this transition. So if we start now talking about integrated diagnostics, then we can get around to the point when not everyone's willing to accept a quality-based Tony? Uh, the AACC, the chemistry group, has a um, committee which actually chair, which is looking at this in a slightly different way, which is getting laboratories more engaged in clinical process. And the model that we're looking at is not so much connected with radiology, although I think that's a great idea. But we look at what happened to the pharmacy community. 10 or 15 years ago, pharmacy was a largely transactional operation. Prescription in the window, fill out which is not that different from where we are in lab today, which is let's move in with an order and then a number flies out in the EMR. And we want to, the, the, the pharmacy is really transforming itself. And they're on rounds now. A lot of clinicians sort of handed over management of their patient's drug uh, therapy to pharmacies. There's a lot of opportunities for clinical laboratorians to get involved in that kind of a level, a more direct interaction, specifically looking after individual patients. There are other areas back to that utilization, which have a lot of interest in possible general research, but kind of high interest as well. So the ACC is interested in this. I will share with you, so I've been talking about this for nine years. I will share with you the fact that the enthusiasm for this concept, comparing radiology against pathology, about 90% of the enthusiasm is on the radiology side, and perhaps 10% on the pathology side. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Ben, go ahead. You're, you're smiling. I Ben's a radiologist. <laughs> I'm a radiologist, and I, I can say this actually is doable, and that the enthusiasm is there on the radiology side. Uh, we're working on this right now to create this basically this integration between radiology and pathology, image presentation and reporting. And we have definitely seen enthusiasm from radiologists and pathologists. But the question I wanted to ask of you is, uh, where are the laughing, jumping up and down clinicians? Uh, because we're having trouble finding them. And I, I, I am an old, I'm a clinician, I'm right. a board certified internist, and I can tell you the very thought of this does make me laugh and jump up and down. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> but, uh, I haven't found uh, kind of kindred spirits out there amongst the clinicians that we have. Well, have you presented to them? 
we have our next in a way and say this is going to make, because I think so many of them are so depressed that they're not going to be out. That could be part of it, that they see it as. It was beaten down so badly. High in the sky. And yeah, that's right. Don't even at this point believe right. that it's possible. Mm-hmm. But we, we showed them demos, uh, mock ups of what we are currently building. And uh, honestly, it, if it were free, of course, we would have no problem. Uh, but as soon as any element of cost is introduced into the equation, uh, the, the laughter fades. Could you tell us, give, give, us us, as I give us some insight into cyclization on radiology? I've been told that some radiologists never look below the diaphragm and some never look above it in terms of abdominal and, and thoracic. Is, is this something, is this a correct, uh, 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 so a holistic approach, or if not, how do you deal with the silos in radiology? It actually isn't so bad for us uh, from that perspective. Most of our radiologists at least like to cross those lines and like to keep a hand in uh, all the different body parts and all the different imaging styles. I would say there is a bit of a divide in oncology imaging, where I think this, of course, is the most useful. Um, The oncology studies are sort of a different animal. They require a different type of attention, a different level of detail, and usually are far more engaging and involved in that you're comparing to multiple prior studies and probably have a greater need for the clinical information that is so very rare in, in, our, in our particular specialty. Um, but I, I think in spite of that, we still, those that are inclined to read oncology studies, uh, see the value in this. And I think for the most part, the pathologists that we have presented this to, their reservations have mainly been around the practice of digital pathology and not about this actual integration. Um, you know, the digital pathology is a critical component of this. Obviously, we have to have digital images. And that either represents an additional step for the pathology lab to make a digital copy of the image, uh, or for that matter, a a leap of faith in actually making the initial digital diagnosis in pathology, which uh, is yet to come. And so that's that's the main reservation I see from the pathologists. From the radiologists, if they have the right inclination, sort of an oncology imaging mindset, uh, they see the value as well. Um, and, and yet, when we go to the clinicians, we even try to narrow our focus from oncology in general to simply, well, let's, let's do mammography and uh, get a toehold there. And yet still, um, we haven't, haven't seen uh, the whole concept embraced to the, to the point where we've got a clinical prototype ready to go. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot, but to what extent do you teach and do you yourself integrate imaging reports into your recognition when you sign out, let's say, complex cases? Well, of course, the, uh, the platform would be uh, multidisciplinary rounds, as in tumor boards, for example. This is the time I do gynae pathology, I do pancreatic delivery, and these are disciplines that are very radiology uh, dependent as much as it is pathology dependent. So it, it is, uh, we use that as a quality control. We present our findings in tumor board. We come back and modify our reports. Uh, I, I always dream of a real time integration. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Is that, is, would that be common or uncommon in a complex case to look at radiology reports by a surgical pathologist? We, yes, we go into Epic and we look at the images. That would be a routine. But I wouldn't say routine, but as you said in the special complex case, mm-hmm. I know I do it, many of my colleagues here do it. I've got a slide here showing discordance studies that have been done between radiology and histopathologic findings. Now, I, I make the point in, in the slide that these are studies usually done by people that like the notion of integrated diagnostics and therefore they want to prove the hypothesis. I also understand that, that deciding what's a significant discordance and a non-significant discordance is, 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 is complex. 
But I think the numbers rise, taking off come or something like 20% discordance with the two trivial differences in the significant. I do know there have been medical legal cases where a radiology report would come out part of a biopsy and say this is X, Y, Z, and then the biopsy said you can't find it. So, so one of the ways to start here is doing discordant studies or studying that literature. And the advantage of this is then for the, for the doubting promises, you say, look, inevitably talking to each other creates a higher quality report. In one of the databases I personally developed for tumor boards was uh, a tick where the person ticks in real time after discussion whether pathology agreed with radiology. And I flip that back to pathologists and say, this is our discordance rate. And your 20%, I think, is right on the on, uh, right. So of that 20%, probably the majority are non-significant, but there's going to be some critical ones there. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so I had a comment and a question. In terms of routine use of radiology, I think it depends on the, the subspecialty. So, for instance, in bone pathology, you look at the radiology reports and the images on almost all cases where malignancy is involved. So, I do think that looking at radiology is, is a, is a all-the-time thing in certain arenas. Uh, the other question I had for you is, you focused in on uh, combining radiology and uh, pathology. But uh, what about other image intensive areas like uh, GI and, and stuff, dermatology? Absolutely. And do uh, you think that uh, platforms like Apollo Pax, as an example, have a part in trying to put everything in one place? Or are those just uh, shopping carts where the clinicians still have to dig it out? Well, uh, let me just go and put on my political hat. <laughs> and I gave you a teaser at the beginning saying that we have an existential threat. In, 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 in about informatics. Um, looking at Epic, and I'm going to get to your, respond to your, your question. <clears throat> a vendor like Epic now dominates the U.S. in terms of the high end hospitals, and it's now moving internationally. <clears throat> um, whether you're interested in ECO or you're not, I think the momentum for, let's say, the routine test is moving toward, obviously, moving toward the EHR, enterprise wide uh, system model. I think we need to carve out in pathology informatics areas where a vendor like Epic doesn't want to go or can't go. And I think this notion of integrated diagnostics would be an example of that. I think right now their use of, uh, of um, analytics on the single Epic database is really not very good at all, and they outsource some of that. So essentially, this, this notion of integrated diagnostics has an analytic feel. If we create our own server and get the capital for that, we'd say, we own this. This is owned by pathology and radiology and other diagnostic specialties. And the field is moving so fast that the algorithms of, of, of last week will not be today's algorithms. By the way, they'll have tremendous value as intellectual property. So this could be revenue accruing to the department. But a way to get into this business is to say to the C-suite, we want an enterprise image server that will have all the imaging for the whole hospital on a single server. Pathology, radiology, GI, cardiology, and so forth. Everyone wants that. That's the direction. And then you add to that, that uh, interface with that image server then would be all the textual reports generated in pathology, cardiology, and so forth. So you have a, a set of resource then you build the algorithms. And one of the fastest ways to build those algorithms is to look retrospectively at cancer, let's say breast cancer cases. When the patient is first seen, you look at what the, the sort of pattern of, of imaging that was ordered, the pattern of molecular, the pattern of other chemistry, and you look at that sequence, and you say, we can do a better job of getting that patient to the diagnosis using algorithms. So I, I envision an enterprise-wide server connected to all the textual data for the diagnostic reports. So I've covered a lot of this material. <clears throat> We've talked about that we're in the golden age of diagnosis. I'll make reference to, I have made reference <coughs> to pathology and radiology diagnosticians. This is a term I've made up. It doesn't appear anywhere else, but I wanted to distinguish us from the clinicians. 
uh, the relationship currently between pathology and radiology, I would say, is respectful but somewhat distant. So let me ask you the question, Mahmoud and others, how often do you have active discussions with radiologists about cases face-to-face, -face, other than, let's say, um, tumor, uh, tumor conferences? Is this something that's unusual or unusual? I would say uh, certainly tumor conferences and uh, on-site assessment or uh, fine needle respiration, that's, that's a great sure. venue as well. Outside of that, I don't know, I wouldn't know. I think I know soft tissue and bone pathologists like to talk, to speak with uh, radiologists about some of the findings. Um, but other than that, I would say it's... Well, let me draw an analogy. In cancer hospitals, you may have heard of... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. talk about something that I call an integrated diagnostic center. This is going on, uh, Leo referred to it in Los Angeles. This is a physical or virtual center to which patients with undiagnosed masses get referred by a PCP or an internist. And this is staffed largely by, theoretically and in fact in practice, staffed largely by pathologists and radiologists and driven by servers with algorithms. And the point here is the patient presents themselves with an undiagnosed mass, and the purpose is to come to a final diagnosis as quickly as possible. Now, in very practical terms, the fastest way to do this is align with the radiologists that have the breast imaging centers. So what you do is drop into that breast imaging center your pathologist to do the aspiration biopsies and essentially take advantage of that physical space and create an integrated diagnostic center with existing real estate and give much faster service. I've talked about a lot of diagnosis in 24 to 48 hours. You might ask, why is that more efficient? It's more efficient because right now the system is the PCP or the internist who maybe discovers a mass, then has to coordinate all this care, the biopsies, the imaging studies. If we have control over that with algorithms running on the server, we can do it much faster. And if we approach the, 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 the payers and say, this is our plan, we can get to a diagnosis in 24 to 48 hours rather than the typical one to two or three weeks for a breast lesion, I think that they'll be very excited about that. John. How is that going to save money in healthcare? I believe time is money. If you can get to a diagnosis faster, I also believe there's great psychological benefit for arriving at a tumor diagnosis faster. But the, the major answer is time is money. And in fact, with these algorithms, the fastest path to a diagnosis, you may go to a more expensive procedure, but you avoid all these testing cycles to get to that. If, if you get a definitive answer with a particular uh, pro, uh, imaging or, st or study, you should go right to that. Yes, sir. A comment based on that too, John. I mean, some of the stuff coming out with molecular pathology uh, is showing that if you get to the right diagnosis sooner, and then you also characterize that, you get the patients on the right therapy sooner, you avoid potential uh, toxicities of off-target therapies, et cetera, and that, that saves money as well because you have overall fewer adverse events. Let me draw an analogy between what are called multidisciplinary teams in a cancer hospital and our work. A multidisciplinary team is the norm in all cancer hospitals, uh, for the, certainly for the toughest cases. And you have sitting around the table a radiation uh, 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 oncologist, you have a medical oncologist, you have radiologists, you have surgeons, uh, you have pathologists. Uh, you have, and essentially what happens is the individual inclinations of the specialists get submerged in terms of the best benefit for the patient. So what I'm talking about with integrated diagnostics is analogous on the diagnostic side to a multidisciplinary team with pathologists, radiologists, and so forth. I do not believe that in most cases that you're going to need FaceTime for these conferences. I can believe we can do this with um, 
uh, with tower links uh, so that the, so we would meet, we don't have to leave our offices. But the tough cases, we can have conferences, look at the images, have the discussion, and make it much more efficient. I believe the vast majority of, of these reports you, that you could call super reports or merged reports, I think the majority of these, from an IT perspective, are fairly simple. It's what I would call mail merge, basically putting in ones. It's what it's what uh, UCLA is doing. Essentially, merge radiology and pathology reports. I believe when you do this, that the discordances will jump off the page once you see this in a single report. But the complex patients, there's going to have to be some discussion about how this corresponds, what do they mean by this particular term, and then the bottom line will be the critical piece of that. Now, this uh, goes back to 2006. This is my first broad note I talked about should pathology uh, merge with radiology. I realized that I did this for shock value to get people's attention. I don't think this is going anywhere, not in the short term. But I also made reference in 2006 to integrated reports. This is, this is what my blog looks like. I've got some corporate underwriters that help keep it going. I made reference to value-based care. I don't know where this is going to end up, and I'm as confused about this as everyone else, and I realize how sophisticated and subtle this is going to be to move to a value-based system. How do you assess value and so forth? But I feel very certain that we're going to move away from fee-for-service. Does anyone have any ideas about the basic underpinnings of the value-based, how this reimbursement would, would go under such a system? I've never read anything. Maybe you have some ideas about that. I don't see anyone raising their hand, so, so I'm not sure how this is going to work, but everyone says we're moving in this direction. So this is what I call the arguments for more integration of diagnostic information. I've given you all my ideas. This is just a, a list. Information is growing more complicated. There's pressure on clinicians. About three or four years ago, someone asked me the question, what percent of patients seen by oncologists uh, lack a diagnosis? And the answer is zero. An oncologist will not accept an undiagnosed patient. And the cynical reason for that is that they're reimbursed uh, on the basis of the treatment, and, and therefore they're not going to run around looking. So the running around is by the PCPs or by the interns. And I put this in boldface, no medical specialists are better suited for the task of integrating diagnostics than those who generate the original reports. This is what we do. This is a task I think that we should take on. And I think that this will uh, be tremendous added value to what we do. Uh, my, uh, my lecture will be available to all of you. So I'm not going to get through all the slides, but you can look at all my arguments. I made the point that we need to better integrate AP and CP. I know they've developed on a different trajectory. Uh, I'm old enough to remember, let's say, the 80s when uh, running a clinical pathology in a small hospital was very, very lucrative because the pathologist got a percentage of, of the gross. Um, however, the hospital executives soon understood what was going on. They put the pathologists on salary. As a result of this, most pathologists, at least in smaller hospitals, have migrated to surgical PET, which was their first love. And in many hospitals, the pathologists rarely go into the clinical labs. And they're run by uh, lab scientists and by, and by med techs. So this created this system between AP and CP. So that's an interesting question. How do, what steps do we need? Do you, do you think it's a problem? And if so, how would we would integrate more closely? And what would be the first steps, John? Uh, what do you think would be the steps in order to create a, a closer correlation between CP and AP? Well, uh, I have thought a lot about this, and uh, I think one good example of where this is needed, of course, is in the diagnosis of multiple myeloma, because the laboratory data is very critical to making the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. But as you pointed out so nicely, that data is in one part of EPIC, and everything else is in another part of EPIC. And you should be able to pull all that data together into one, one report. And you yourself pointed out how arduous it is for you to collect all the data. Right. Yeah. Right. So I don't know what we're going to do from an IT perspective. 
my own bias about EHRs is, is that, that this has been retrograde for us. And that the, like the EHRs, like the previous HRS systems, were designed to drop a bill and not to improve the efficiency of physicians and their workflow. So I don't know how we're going to move toward a better system, but my only solution is this integrated diagnostic server in the short term. Uh, this is an interesting question and one that I grappled with. If this is such a good idea, why has no one ever tried this before? Uh, and this is my... <laughs> It could be it's not as good an idea as I think it is. This is my response. Most of us operate comfortably in our silos. Diagnosticians more productive in their silos. And I've been with radiologists and seen how unbelievably productive they are. And one of the interesting things about the productivity of radiologists is they've uh, adopted um, speech recognition probably for 10 years. And it's like pulling teeth to get it integrated into pathology. And I've asked some people why that is. Uh, pathologists less flexible. I'm not quite sure why that is. But do you have? Do you do speech recognition here in surgical path? Oh yeah. Is it universal? Uh, I'll have to let Mahmoud answer that. But I'm not sure it's universal. Yeah, it, it is not. Uh, <laughs> pathologists use it uh, differently. The workflow is not consistent within the uh, Fairview system. Uh, other hospitals probably are more dependent than. Uh, on it than our pathologists here. Uh, free for, for service compensates us for specialization and productivity, not necessarily for data integration, potentially high risk for setting out in a new professional direction. That's why we have to do it gradually. We need to get a consensus. Um, I teach often the following. If you divide the population into three segments, there are the people who are the change junkies like myself that thrive on change. And these are people who are very dangerous. The second group are the people from Missouri who say, I'll change if you show me that it's superior. And the third group are the people who hate change and will not change unless they're absolutely forced. Now, the tricky part about this third group is they know it's not probably socially acceptable to be that rigid. So they say, I love change. Just show me the change. It's perfect. And then they'll give you 100 reasons why this is a problem. So the reason why this is so important is you will never get 100% uh, of your faculty or anyone to support a change. You can work with the change junkies, and those are the ones that you adopt initially to say, try this out. Then the people from Missouri come along, and then you have to walk over the people who hate change competition for capital resources in hospitals. One of my problems with EHRs is that they're so expensive. Uh, I would say in most academic centers, they will talk about spending three or four hundred million, but what they're doing is probably spending a billion dollars on EPIC. And what that does is suck capital out of every, every other uh, unit of the hospital. And finally, and this is the ironic thing, is that patients in C-suite assume the integration already exists. So I've talked to lay people, and they say, I'm sure you're talking to the radiologists all the time about my case. And I say, and I say sure we are. <laughs> Let me go to my last summary slide. This will be made available, and you can go over it. But everything I've talked about, I've, I've viewed. Let's see, take home points. Pathology informatics has a rich history of deploying IT to enhance the mission of the specialty. And Don was one of the pioneers in this. We now need to turn our attention to integration with the other key diagnostic specialty, radiology, and then uh, hopefully after that would be GI, cardiology, and so forth. And the cardiologists are amazing. They've always controlled their own imaging right from the get-go. This new strategy will enhance the diagnostic franchise in hospitals, help prepare for value-based medicine, and revitalize pathology informatics if we pursue integrated diagnostic servers. I believe that integrated diagnostics is analogous to multidisciplinary teams. It's coordination across specialty boundaries on the diagnostic side. I believe we should pursue the development of these integrated diagnostic service. I believe they will be prototyped in the academic centers. And this is under the control of pathology and radiology. We will own this. And finally, also consider the development of a physical or virtual integrated diagnostic center to facilitate the diagnosis of undiagnosed masses. 
Thank you very much. I'll take any final questions. Tony. How about industry in this group? Like Siemens makes equipment for radiology and they make equipment for labs. Good, good question. Siemens, um, about seven or eight years ago, bought biodiagnostics and got really active in, in, uh, in that space. And, um, and, and they were actually quoting some of my stuff in some of their company materials. And then they had a tremendous scandal. They were, the CEO was accused of bribing, and they got distracted. They got a new CEO, and he lost interest in diagnostics. I don't know where GE or Philips stand on this, but I would think this would be a natural. But I think if we approach some of the companies with this notion of an integrated diagnostic server, I think they'd be very interested in it. On the, on the lab medicine side, Roche has an interest recently in this area uh, because you know they see the clinical lab market as a mature market, and this is one way to differentiate good, themselves. Good point. I, my own not, not with radiology, but yeah, pure my own bias medicine. is, and Tony, you're closer to this than I am, but I've never been that impressed, at least with within my viewpoint of the innovation going on with the IVD companies. I do know they have very little taste for software. They only did it to create the sort of middleware that helped them, but they got burned years ago trying to get into the LIS business. So I, that's not the first place I would look, but I think it's worth talking to them. Yeah, well, I just point out that Roche is an interest in this. Right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Throughout the presentation, you kind of talked about these, you know, the silos being established, and there's not really a good way to get out, and how difficult the change would be. Um, I'm new to pathology; I'm just a post sophomore fellow. But we, you know, as a, you know, someone's going to be a resident someday, we don't really have those silos. We don't really have. You better find them fast. So I just wonder if there's any consideration of doing this from the bottom up, as opposed to a top down new individuals of the uh, you know, residents would work closer with the radiologists so that they start out that way from the get-go. It would be great. It would be fantastic. And I think this could be chairman's initiative to create this kind of discussion. But I will say in academic medicine, if you're not in a silo, you got a big problem. And I'm the ultimate silo person, so I can talk about this. I know what it feels like living in a silo for 30 years. But the, the system, and I encourage you to do this, and, and the chairman's initiative can create these dialogues. But the system rewards special, ultra specialization, particularly in academics. Yes, my name. It is not all, uh, all bad. I see a lot of hope in emerging uh, specialties, and subspecialization can actually, if we use it properly, can help us. For example, uh, when I was back in training in pathology, we didn't hear about molecular pathology, we didn't hear about cyto cytogenetics. Molecular pathology and cytogenetics, I think, are the prototypes of bridging that, uh, that gap between CP and AP tumor markers. And uh, so more and more, and, and John already mentioned myeloma and flow cytometry and what happened with it. So all of these fields are technically CP, but what they are doing, they are actually bringing us all together. The hematopathologists have always been my heroes, because they were always morphologists and always superb in terms of lab testing. So, but, but the, the, the disease has forced them to do that, I think, in order to understand. So first and foremost, we want to understand disease, and we learn what we need to learn to understand that disease. And that's going to happen, of course, in breast. You have to understand genomic cancer genomics in order to read out breast biopsies and even imaging, as we heard before. So, so the experiments are being run. Well, thank you very much. It's 9.01. Appreciate your attention.